it, it's a great honour to be here. And um, I wanted to uh, give a different talk to the presentation that I gave at TED last year. And I thought that a good place to start from is the fact that I'm sure, as many of the people in this room know, every year the um, TED organisers give a couple of prizes which they call the TED Prize. And last year, one of the prizes was given to the great oceanographer, Sylvia Earle, who's devoted her life to understanding the oceans and now to saving the oceans. Our oceans do actually urgently need saving. They need our help because they're under stresses from incredible number of sources, one of which is overfishing. Some scientific reports recently have proposed that if the current models are correct, that we may be the last generation on Earth to eat wild fish because we, we're so overfishing our stocks. Um, the oceans are also being terribly stressed by pollutants and by the dumping of toxic waste and even nuclear waste in places like off the coast of Africa and in the Mediterranean. They're also being stressed by fertiliser runoff and a huge amount of excess nitrogen that's going into the oceans from agricultural areas. But my talk tonight is about a specific area where our oceans face stress, and that is on coral reefs. Coral reefs the world over are basically dying out. It's sometimes said that reefs are the canaries down the mine shaft of planet Earth, because canaries are very sensitive organisms and they alert miners when there's gas leakages, etc. Um, reefs are effectively alerting us that global warming is here, it's now, it's not in the future, it's real. Carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere that's causing the, um, the warming of the atmosphere is also causing another problem for oceans, and that is that um, about 30% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere ultimately gets absorbed by the oceans, which may be good for the atmosphere in that it takes it out of there, but it also acidifies the oceans so much so that scientists are beginning now to talk about the Coca-Cola ocean. And what this means is that the acidification actually causes chemical reactions within the coral structures so that the coral polyps can no longer form their hard exoskeletons. And if current predictions are correct, coral reefs may no longer be able to form by 2030. That's within our lifetime. And certainly, if current trends continue, it's very possible that by the end of this century, there will be no coral reefs left on Earth. Given that coral reefs are estimated to be home to up to 2 million people, uh, sorry, 2 million different kinds of organisms, that would be an ecological catastrophe. And my sister Christine and I decided about um, four and a half years ago, it was in the end of 2005, that we would like to um, crochet a coral reef as the kind of homage to the disappearing wonder of these vast organisms. We grew up in the state of Queensland, Australia, which is where the Great Barrier Reef is. And the disappearance of the Barrier Reef weighs very heavily on the consciousness of Australians. So we thought we'd make a bit of a handicraft response and we'd do something beautiful. So four and a half years ago, we sat in our living room in Los Angeles and began to crochet a bit of coral, thinking that this would be a lovely artistic way to bring some attention to the plight of coral reefs and help to make people aware of how serious this really was. So we did this beginning just ourselves, but we always thought of it that it would be something that we could get other people involved with. So we put out a call on our website asking people to get involved. And one of the things that we decided that we'd do specifically was to make a crochet invocation of coral bleaching. Bleaching is the effect that happens to corals when they begin to get stressed through environmental pressures like, global, like warming of the oceans or pollutants. And the, the bleaching of corals doesn't mean that they're actually dead. It means that the corals are stressed. And the reason they go white is because the most of the colour from corals actually comes not from the coral organisms themselves, but from these little microorganisms called zooxanthellae that they keep within their bodies to help them feed. And when the corals get stressed, they expel these zooxanthellae and, and they basically lose their colour. If the conditions improve, the, the um, 
the zoous anthellae will come back and they will regain their colour. But if the conditions stay bad, the bleaching will become permanent and then the reefs are basically dying. And that coral bleaching is now, used to be a very rare phenomenon when I was a child, but now it's happening in places like the Barrier Reef every two or three years with increasing frequency and increasing magnitude. So this is one of the proofs that global warming is here because this is, it's now understood that the majority of coral bleaching now is happening because of the rising sea temperatures. So here are some pictures of our bleached reef. One of the things that began to happen with this project is that we invited, uh, we put out a call on our website inviting people to come and more and more people started coming, so much so that the reef began to split from one reef into many, into a number of reefs, and it's just kept exponentially growing, so that, that now there are many, many different reefs. We've been invited to um, show the exhibition all around the world, everywhere from the Andy Warhol Museum to the Hayward Gallery in London, and we're very honoured to be showing it here in Dublin at the Science Gallery. It's the first time that we've actually had the opportunity to show it specifically in a science setting. And uh, it's going to be a thrill for us because this time we get to really concentrate on the mathematics as well, and I'll get to the mathematics in a minute. But a great coup is that the project has been invited to show at the end of this year at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., and it will be the first time that the Smithsonian has ever shown something that they regard as an art project, and the reason for that is because they recognise that this is, is a project with deep scientific roots. We always conceived of this as a communal project, and we originally thought that maybe a dozen, two dozen people would actually get involved. But the funny thing is that as time has gone on, thousands of women all over the world have got involved. I'd like to say thousands of people, but the reality is we've had, we've had about 3,000 people around the world now, 3,000 people contribute models to this, and of those, three of them have been men. <laughs> I really, I knew it would be gender, bar, gender skewed when I started, but I really didn't think the figures would break down quite that radically. So I do use the word people, but the reality is most of those are female people. So one of the things that happened was that um, Chrissy and I started doing reefs and various people came to us largely through our website and they started sending us corals and we'd work with them. But when we had our first major exhibition in Chicago, um, we decided that it would be nice for the people of Chicago to make their own reef. So we worked with the community in the six months leading up to the exhibition, the people of Chicago made their own reef. And so what's happened is that the, the project has kind of become viral. So it's sending out spawn. So as well as the reefs that are directly done under Chrissy and my um, direction with our direct group of collaborators, we have these reefs coming into being in other cities around the world. And just as real reefs replicate by sending out these spawn into the, into the water that then go and um, settle elsewhere and start growing new reefs elsewhere, so the crochet reef is sending out spawn. These spawns of, of our major reef we call satellite reefs, and this will give you some indication of the scale of it. So there's my sister Chrissy sitting um, in part of what is the reef produced by the people of Chicago and New York. And this is an exhibition where we get three, you get to see three cities at Chicago, New York, and what was produced by the people of Arizona. And every time this happens, more and more people get involved, so that in each of these ones now, there are literally hundreds of people making these enormous um, conglomerations of coral. Some of you are no doubt sitting there thinking, look, if you people wanted to make an artistic invocation of coral reefs, why on earth are you doing it in crochet? You know, it's wool and water, they don't exactly go together. Why not chisel it in marble or carve it out of, you know, wood? Well, it turns out if you're going to make an artistic representation of coral reefs, that crochet is not just um, a casual medium, it's the necessary medium to choose. And um, the reason for that is that the, sorry, these frilly crenellated structures that you see, that even though this is a fantasy, you all immediately recognise that as, as, a coral, as coral reef structures. And that's because actual corals and many of the other organs that, organisms that live on reefs, like nudibranchs and sea slugs and kelps and sponges, 
these crenellated frilly structures are all actually organic manif manifestations of a kind of geometry called hyperbolic geometry. And that's a pure um, hyperbolic geometry done in crochet. Why is it done in crochet? Because it turns out that the only way we have really to model hyperbolic space, hyperbolic structures, is with crochet. And that is a discovery that was made by a mathematician named Dr. Dana Tamina at Cornell University. It turns out that nature actually loves hyperbolic structures, even though mathematicians thought this was impossible and spent several hundred years trying to prove it was impossible. Here are two individuals who've never heard about mathematical impossibility <laughs> theorems, and they've been doing it since the Silurian age. The oceanic realm in particular abounds with, math sorry, with hyperbolic structures. So here's some pictures of coral forms that all have variations of hyperbolic geometry. There's a whole taxonomy of hyperbolic structures and wonders in the ocean. And so too, it turns out, there's an endless taxonomy possible of hyperbolic crochet species. So here on the left, what you see is um, an almost mathematically pure one. And then on the, uh, over to the right, there are elaborations. They are, not exact, they are not the mathematically perfect ones. But what it turns out is that just as there is um, a DNA code underlying all orga organisms on Earth, so too there is a code underlying these crochet organisms, which is basically a very simple formula that when you do it perfectly with the very simplest formula, you get the mathematically pure ones. But when you branch out from the mathematically pure formula and do aberrations or mutations, you, get, you deviate from mathematical perfection, but you get this whole ever-evolving taxonomy of um, almost hyperbolic forms that become like the evolution of life on Earth, just as the ev life evolved from starting with a very simple DNA code, which is single-celled organisms, and then it gradually complexifies over time to get a whole taxonomy so that you get a whole tree of life that we have today. So too, as these projects develop, we've got an ever-evolving crochet tree of life and everybody who takes up this um, methodology seriously finds that they can develop things that we'd never thought of. And I just want to show you some pictures of the extraordinary works that our primary contributors have made. And this is by taking the underlying crochet code and deviating from the strict mathematical perfection and just saying, what if I do a bit here? What if I do a bit there? What if I branch out in this way? Just as life evolves from Life doesn't feel compelled to stick to pure codes or pure mathematical formalisms. Life evolves and complexifies and diversifies. And all of these structures are made by women who have come from all walks of life. They're among this group of people, there are mothers and mathematicians. There are students and housewives and scientists and yarn store owners, and they've all chosen to do things in extraordinary ways that we would never have thought of. This is the, the last specific example I'm going to show you, and I just want to point out something about this. This is the only thing that we've had done that is electric. It's actually crocheted from a, what's called electroluminescent wire that was developed by the US military for lighting the insides of tanks. And this woman, Eleanor Kent, who's a media artist in San Francisco, took this medium and crocheted it into this fantastic bioluminescent crochet coral organism. Eleanor is our oldest contributor. She's 78 years old, and she calls this her granny tech. And it's, <laughs> and it's an amazing thing. Every time we've had an exhibition, and this, and this has been in it, every single guy who walks into the gallery immediately goes to the electric thing and starts saying, what is it and how does it work? And it's like totally uncanny. The guys go to the thing that flashes. <laughs> it, 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 it's so extraordinary. And basically what this project has allowed is extraordinary creative expression by so-called ordinary people. This project has astounded me and continues to astound me, not because of what I've done, but because of what all of our contributors done. 
they've all collectively produced and individually produced things that I would never have imagined that when we started this project, Chrissy and I could never have conceived it could go in a direction like this. And it's caused me to ask, what is the meaning of this project? And I just make two last comments about, um, about the project. I think one very important thing about the project, we hear again and again from our contributors, is that this allows women to intersect with mathematics and science. Nobody is really communicating to women about science. And again and again, our contributors tell us how powerful and meaningful it is for them to be doing something in their hands that actually relates to the mathematics that ultimately underlies general relativity and which tell us about the shape of our universe. So I think one of the messages of the project is there are women who really want to engage with mathematics and science if only they were given the opportunity and this project is allowing that. The other thing that I think is phenomenal about this project that we hear again and again from our contributors is that they say how much it means to them to contribute to something that is greater than themselves. And in this sense, the crochet reef is a beautiful metaphor for coral reefs themselves. Just as coral reefs are formed by little tiny polyps that in themselves are, as it were, almost trivial, but together in their millions, they produce something like the Great Barrier Reef. So too, the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef Project allows thousands of women collectively to produce this ever-growing, ever-evolving, wondrously big structure that couldn't possibly be produced by an individual. And I've come to think that if there is a message in the project, it is this, that we as human beings None of us individually could solve the problem of global warming. It's much bigger than any of us as individuals. But collectively, if we all act together and change our behaviour as individuals en masse, realising that we are in it together colonially, just as um, coral reefs are, co are colonial organisms, that together, collectively, we do, I think, have the power to do something about global warming. It is, as it were, the tiny little polyps that are telling us it is not us as individuals that it matters. It is us collectively as a whole that actually has power. Thank you.